can hear you. We cannot yet see you, but we will be able to see you shortly. Sure, thank you very much. We have a, we have a video first, that's why I have the video here. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining the, the side event on the Global Goal on Adaptation today. Uh, my name is Alexandra. Uh, I'm from Sokagakai International and together with um, my colleagues from Brahma Kumaris, from the Lutheran World Federation, from, uh, from uh, Bread for the World and ACT Alliance. We are very happy to uh, welcome you all for this discussion. Uh, and um, we have... Uh, Proposed to really um, focus on the global goal on adaptation. Um, and I'm just going to give you a super brief introduction and then we'll go and really listen from uh, the great speakers that um, uh, have joined us today. So, the global goal on adaptation. Um, it's part of the Paris Agreement, uh, Article 7, uh, and it was um, uh, adopted, but many parts of it uh, were not uh, um, gone into many details, so there was um, uh, maybe a lack of uh, shared understanding around some really important aspects to it. And so at COP26, um, a process was started uh, that is uh, going to be a two-year process that aims to go at COP28, uh, to really have a work program on the global goal uh, on adaptation to help come to a shared understanding and really fulfill uh, that aspect of the Paris agreement to, agreement to enhance adaptive capacity and resilience and to reduce vulnerability and contribute to uh, other goals, including sustainable development. So now we are... Uh, here in Bonn um, with the first uh, workshops that took place around the Global Goal on Adaptation. And the, that work program is called, um, short name, GLASS. So it's the Glasgow Sharmel Sheikh work program. So maybe you will hear them refer to the GLASS and that, that's what it means. Um, so now, um, to really dive into this uh, uh, global goal on adaptation, we wanted to uh, also take the perspective of vulnerable communities. And so that's why we will also have uh, some speakers that will also specifically speak to that aspect. Um, we are very happy to have today with you, uh, with us, um, uh, Patricia uh, Ngioru, who is the IPCC focal point uh, for Kenya and, the, and G77. Uh, science and Review Coordinator. Thank you very much for joining. Um, we have uh, Mr. Frode Neergaard, who is the lead on adaptation and loss and damage uh, issues from the Danish delegation. He's uh, also the chief advisor in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And here uh, at the UNFCCC is the co-chair of the VASO uh, International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. We have Adriana Vasquez, who is uh, representing La Ruta del Clima and who has been working also following uh, loss and damage uh, and adaptation. So who will be able to also really bring uh, perspective from various communities. Uh, and over there we have uh, Mr. Jan Fry, who is the newly uh, appointed UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Climate Change. Um, and he's also um, a long experience within the UNFCCC. We're very happy to have you here as well. Um, and we have here uh, Mr. Jamie Williams, who is a um, uh, policy advisor for Islamic Relief and who has been a lead and really following uh, uh, adaptation as well. Online, we will have Kulekani Magwaza, uh, who is going to bring uh, also uh, views um, as a young person and from vulnerable communities uh, from Africa. And we also have James Bagwan, Reverend James Bagwan from the Pacific Council of Churches, uh, who is unable, who was unable to be here in person, but with whom we will start now, uh, sharing a video uh, message from him uh, with his perspective and bringing the voices of vulnerable communities from the Pacific. So let us start with James now. I will play the video and then we will go into each question for everyone. 
Nissan Bulavinaka and warm Pacific greetings to you in Bonn as you um, gather for this very important conversations midway uh, between COP26 and COP27. I'm very grateful to be able to join in this unpacking of the global goal on adaptation and present some perspectives from vulnerable communities. When we look at the science regarding the climate change impacts and we look at the need for adaptation in the Pacific, the reality really um, echoes or adds a, the, the picture to what we have seen from the IPCC AR6 uh, working group in their contribution. And you know we have an alarming reality that we face in terms of what the climate crisis is doing. We have seen that particularly in the context of COVID-19 in the last few years, where we have had COVID-19 exacerbating an already challenging situation in the context of the extreme weather patterns that we experience in the um, impact of rising sea levels and ocean acidification. We are facing and we continue to face uh, extreme weather patterns in the form of more intense, more regular um, uh, at high category cyclones or hurricanes, as you may call them, we face floods on a regular basis and we're experiencing more intense and prolonged dry spells or droughts. What's also we are, we are noticing is that the um, cyclone season that we experience in the Pacific, which usually is from November to April, is now starting as early as um, September and continues well into May. We already, um, just at the end of May, had one cyclone, Cyclone Gina, which appeared out of nowhere, well out of the traditional season. And so we, we need to understand that this is now becoming the norm for us. And so adaptation needs to take into, a play, into account these issues that we're going to be continually facing more extreme weather patterns. And we need to strengthen our responses and our preparation for these natural disasters as they increase as a result of climate change. We need to have more investment on uh, our structures. We need to have more investment on our uh, response mechanisms. We need to have more investment on, um, on um, the ability of local communities to be able to respond to these natural disasters. Because if the capital city is cut off, if our humanitarian uh, organizations are not able to get into those communities, the communities themselves need to be able to, to survive until the general bigger help arrives. And then in the context of the rising sea levels, we continue to see the need for uh, the building of more seawalls. This is becoming a, a, an ongoing issue where we continue to wait for support. And when the funding comes, we need to negotiate about where the seawalls will be built, who gets the seawalls first, and what happens to those countries or communities that uh, have to wait for the next round of funding. Um, we need to recognize that um, um, saltwater inundation into plantations and crops uh, form its own uh, challenges, as well as the salt water going into freshwater drinking areas. So the basic issues that we would uh, in the past take for granted with Pacific Islands being so abundant are now becoming very serious issues. So if you add the salt water inundation into the, uh, the plantations and the water table, and then you exacerbate that with the extreme weather patterns. That means there are long periods of time where people are struggling to get basic things like fresh water, to get basic things like being able to plant uh, and grow their own food. And then you add the increase in ocean acidification caused by the warming of the ocean, and that affects not only uh, you know, the life in the ocean and, and the, the agency and the, the services that the ocean provides in terms of regulating the Earth's climate and oxygen, but our food sources, for those of us who depend on the sea for, for fish, for shell, fish, um, and, and other food sources for seaweed, etc. And so when you look at that, that really tells us about the struggle that Pacific Islanders are facing as a result of the increasing impacts of climate change. And this is therefore the urgency for the strong call on the rapid reduction 
of global climate, uh, global carbon emissions. If we look at the, the next issue around um, how we address adaptation, um, we need a stronger, um, more robust investment into adaptation because this is the way in which we ensure that communities are able to access uh, the funds that they need to, dis to do the adaptation processes or, or, or projects that they feel are important for them. And this is a, a very important issue because we need to understand that Pacific communities have their indigenous knowledge and wisdom, they have the experience, and they have this, the understanding of the on-the-ground context. When we go in with uh, pre-designed or preconceived ideas of adaptation, often we're not taking into consideration the reality on the ground that what may look on paper to be a very good adaptation project may not take into account the biodiversity in the community, may not take into account the cultural issues in the community, may not take into account some of the practical issues around food security for the community. And so we need um, uh, adaptation programs that are driven from the community up rather than a top-down approach. We hear a lot about localization, in the humanitarian space. And this is the value of localization when it comes to the development and the design of adaptation uh, projects and responses. We need the agency of our Pacific Island people to be heard and to be part and parcel of the design process, not just consulted and then the program is designed somewhere else, they need to be included in the design of those projects and to recognize that um, their traditional ways of uh, adaptation are part and parcel of the resilience of Pacific communities and could actually ensure that the money that's being invested goes along further than just models that are based on other contexts and other situations. And so we, we hope that um, as the discussions move forward, we're not only going to see more investment in, into adaptation, which is urgently needed, we're not only going to see um, processes which allow communities to directly access that funding, but we're also going to see processes that take into account the knowledge that our Pacific communities and other indigenous, Pacific, uh, other indigenous communities also hold. And so by doing that, we will have a much more, much more resilient communities to the impact of climate change. So while we are trying to reduce the impact of climate change, we're also ensuring that those communities who are vulnerable are able to support themselves and stand in the face of the worsening climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Reverend Bagwan for the, the video message. So um, with that, uh, let me go straight into our first question for Patricia. Um, so from your perspective uh, and linked to the IPCC, the first question we wanted to ask you is, what does the science say regarding climate change impacts and the need for adaptation? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for that question. I hope I'm audible. So uh, James touched on it a little bit in mentioning that the report, particularly the Working Group 1 report, already mentions that warming has reached 1.1 degrees Celsius. And so the risk of extreme events and other severe impacts is higher now. And the report also mentions that we are very close to reaching some tipping points, uh, for example, Arctic sea ice loss, and even the shift or change in the amplitude of the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, circulation. And for some parts of the world, these are very important processes that influence the weather and uh, generally the climate of those re regions. So as climate continues to change and as warming continues, then we are seeing more extreme events being witnessed. And then after that, the working group report, working group two reports now focusing on impacts and vulnerability uh, shows that the impacts of climate change are seen in virtually all sectors. And uh, it highlights as well that about 40% of the world population is at risk or is very vulnerable. And most of these people, part of this 40% are found in developing countries in Africa and generally the global south. 
So from things such as heat waves, from sea level rise, um, extreme droughts and very heavy rainfall and associated uh, flooding. These are things that are already being seen as impacts and as we go into the future are expected to become uh, even worse. Uh, um, on the need of adaptation, something that I particularly liked from this report is the human face that is added to, to so we're not just talking about the impacts, but who is the one being impacted. And it mentions that uh, for us going into the future, it would be um, useful to focus on transformational adaptation. So let's look at the root causes of vulnerability in different regions, and these are context specific, and then see how do we work at uh, removing those root causes. And for me, that was something that was very important, putting the human face to the impacts that we see. And uh, since this is the best science available, then we have enough information going into the future to be able to uh, plan very well for adaptation actions. Thank you very much uh, for this. Um, we Let me go now to uh, you, Frode, for a question. Uh, from your perspective um, and your engagement in the process, um, do our decisions and policy frameworks in the context of the UNFCCC uh, multilateral process provide us with sufficient assurance that we can really confidently say we can address uh, and tackle and really deal with the pre present and future impacts um, of climate change. Thank you very much for that uh, question, for inviting me to be here today. I'm very pleased to be part of this side event. Um, and uh, <coughs> I think it's a, a, absolutely a very relevant um, question. Uh, and when I here it, I kind of reflect on what, how can we use the multilateral system? How can we use the UNFCCC, which is part of this? Is it delivering what we expect? And sometimes I'm, I'm probably looking at a glass half, uh, half uh, empty and sometimes a glass half full. Um, but I tend to be, to be uh, a, an opt optimist, I would say. So first of all, let's, let's acknowledge that the Paris Agreement was delivered some years ago. Let's acknowledge that also the multilateral system has, de has uh, developed the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the Green Climate Fund has come out of a multilateral process. So I think we are looking at major events. And I have colleagues in my Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark saying, oh, you know, it's a crisis in the multilateral system. But I think we must remind ourselves of those achievements that have, have been delivered uh, during the course. Is it moving uh, fast? No, it, it's not moving fast. It's, it's a relatively slow uh, process. And because I have a sort of a, a background as a development practitioner, while also being a climate negotiator, I. I sometimes find it really hard to connect those two things because as a practitioner, you like to see things happening and you're engaged in action on the ground. And once you go into the negotiation rooms, we are haggling uh, about uh, whether it should be shall or must or could or should and things like this and moving commas. So, so there's a lot of frustration in this system also, but, but yet, I'm sort of reminding ourselves we have achieved quite a lot. Even the Glasgow Climate Pact, I think, was, was a, a step, uh, a big step uh, forward. So, um, but, but, but just one more comment on this one, because uh, the question you raise is, is very open. If, if the UNFCCC multilateral system is delivering, I think we must, we must realize, this is, this is a side event about the global goal and adaptation, but obviously, the whole ambition track to keep the 1.5 degrees alive is, is fundamental. It's also fundamental to adaptation. And out in the real world, we know that there are forces that will probably uh, still want to cling on to old-fashioned fossil fuel technologies and that track, and then there are some going the other way. So there, there are some dynamics out there that are determining whether we are successful and can keep the ambition level high on what is so crucial, namely uh, strong efforts to keep 1.5 alive, which also determines how successful we will be on, on the adaptation side.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let us go to Adriana now uh, and to receive some um, of your um, uh, feedback and inputs on really how climate change impacts uh, and eat hard vulnerable communities. So what has been your experience in how communities, particularly indigenous peoples, uh, make an effort to adapt to these impacts? And also maybe could you mention some on the ground challenge faced in this attempt? Thank you for the opportunity of being here. Um, well, I think we all know that when it comes to adaptation, there's a lot of different uh, methodology and approaches that we can use. And broadly speaking, it's recommended that the planning process uh, has to be guided by the analysis of the existing data. And uh, knowing the future uh, climate risk that will affect a community. But also, uh, what I have learned from the communities is that usually they don't have the data and they don't have uh, the knowledge of their future impacts. They just live one day at a time and they are facing day to day different um, effects of climate change. So in my experience working with communities, we have identified different adaptation practices in the, in, especially in Central America, that is where I have worked more. And for example, in the case of Guatemala, that is one of the countries that I have visited in the dry corridor, um, which, is, which is characterized by a very dry seasons. And right now they have um, not rain, especially when it has to rain. Um, they have changed different practices, agricultural practices to adapt to this change. For example, they have created different irrigation systems, especially uh, with, for the families who has access to water. Uh, and in these um, irrigation systems, what they do is that uh, they provide like tubes for every neighbor in a way that they can have water in a moment of the day for different neighbors and that way they can uh, adapt to the lack of water. Also, they have think about the diversification of their crops. In the region that we have visited, they depend especially on corn, but what they have done is that they start identifying other products that may uh, grow in different times of the year, so that way they don't depend only on corn that is basic for their um, diet. And on the other hand, we have Honduras, where Alenca community uh, indigenous community of women have developed different practices related to agroecological practices uh, where they use uh, different uh, crops again and they are uh, diversifying their production and receiving training but this training doesn't come from uh, the government. It, this training comes from other NGOs and other organizations that give them the tools to affront uh, the change in the weather, as they call it. And also, um, they are starting to use organic uh, inputs, um, um, like organic... Um, <laughs> Thank you for, for um, having like more control of their food and also natural pesticides to, to manage the new pests that they have to, to deal with. And in El Salvador, also, uh, there are a lot of important efforts, especially in the coast, uh, where they depend on, the, on mollusks for their food. And what they do, because the mollusks are not growing anymore, they are using cages. So they um, start using shade also to in increase the extraction of curiles, that is a specific um, mollusks that they eat. And that's how these communities that don't have expertise, that don't have knowledge, are adapting to, to climate change. And I think the important fact on this is that there's a, a coordination in the community. There's not support from governments, there's not support from uh, institutions like technical institutions, but it's more from the knowledge that they have and how they have to deal with these constantly changing and they already know that it's not going to rain 
in May and September, and it's going only to rain in June. So what they do is they plan their production around those changes and try to to be ready for the raining season to come. And it's very interesting because when we speak with them, what they say is, I know that part of my production is going to disappear this year. I'm already uh, knowing that I'm going to lose part of my work, but the only thing that I can do is continue planting because I depend on that for feeding my family. So it's part of, of that adaptation process that they are uh, taking part. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for um, bringing uh, the, um, the, this perspective from, from the specific communities that you're working with, um, helping also putting a face uh, on adaptation, as Patricia, you were mentioning. Um, and maybe continuing on that, um, maybe we can have you, Kulekani, uh, sharing from uh, your perspective also as a young person, how does the climate crisis impact on the, well, on the youth, uh, particularly in Africa, uh, which is where you can really give your um, contribution? Thank you very much. I hope I am audible enough. I am greeting everybody who is in Bonn and anyone who is listening to this uh, to this event. <clears throat> yes, I'm Kulegani Makwaza from South Africa. And as I am speaking to you, I am a survivor of so many climate change events. <clears throat> and uh, before I start to share what I have to say, I think I need to recognize uh, with I need to recognize and say uh, condolences to all the families and to all the survivors that have lost their loved ones and the people that they live with. Um, uh, recently in South Africa, just a, a few months ago, uh, in the community where I was born, the community where I grew up, uh, there was a heavy flooding, heavy rains and flooding that happened and more than four lost. Um, and uh, many of these people, I know them, which is why I think, you know, even in these talks, whether we are in Bonn or, or anywhere, we still need to recognize them. But I'm also mentioning this word of survival because I think we are living in a uh, in an era of survival. You know, there are different survivors. Some, they survive the actual event where they had to be rescued and some, they survive because of privilege. And I believe that many people who are in formal talks right now, they may be survivors because of privileges. But let me just subject myself to it so that I don't find any anybody being defensive. I remember in October 2017, I was doing a workshop uh, in Durban, Durban University of Technology. The next day, I traveled to Johannesburg, uh, one hour flight. And then that day when I traveled, there was flooding happening in Durban and many people died and properties were destroyed. I remember in April 2019, I did the same traveling. And two days when I traveled from my home in Durban, there was flooding that happened, which killed 71 people. Um, and then this, this year, in April 2022, the flooding happened, killing many people, more than 400 of them. But I was not there because I was in another city where I was working. I'm subjecting myself to it because I'm imagining what would happen or what would have happened with, to me if I was there. And I think this is the point that we need to reach, even if we are in formal talks. You know, imagine yourself being in that situation. Would you survive? And if you survive, would you still have, would you still use the same attitude in talking about climate change or not? I will quickly get to um, to to how young people are, um, uh, are are affected, but you know before I tell you about that, I just wanted to sh to show you a um, a picture and then and then I tell you how we are particularly affected by these by these events. And now, yeah, I think this is the picture. I'm not sure if you can see my screen. If you can see my screen, this is the community that, that, that I'm talking about. Um, their home is less than 800 meters from, uh, from this destruction that you're, that you're seeing here. And if you're looking at the picture on, on, on your right, 
uh, it, uh, there were houses there which were swamped. <clears throat> But I want to make just four or five points uh, while you're looking at this picture. And I'm saying this is a season of flood or destruction and loss of life and, 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 and properties. The first, uh, the first thing that you can think of here is that kids will not go to school because there's no bridge, obviously. And kids will not, will not, go, will not go to school because the water systems are no longer in place. They are destroyed by the flood. The second thing is kids if not if they are not going to school if they are missing school more than a month which what just happened in durban more than a month they are less compatible or, co or compatible to securing university spaces and to getting better jobs like other kids in uh, in in a, uh, in what i would say uh, uh, better or industrialized communities or cities you know and then the the, the third point is we cannot all we, we cannot um, is, is that it, kids that are from these communities because of that disadvantage of of skipping schools because of the floods and because of uh, of uh, the stresses for, for for not having water and they are not only unemployed because of uh, because of uh, maybe the, the the usual reasons but the other reason is would be because of unemployability that they are unemployable because of the, the I mean there's there's a lot of uh, drop out from schools and then the last thing that I would say is that if you look at this community this is one of the communities uh, one of many communities in Africa that are sustained by what is normally called the green economy uh, the items that we are selling in our neighbors the items that we are uh, that that we are selling to our immediate market so we cannot grow our businesses so even though we cannot get employment even as young people the ideas that we have we cannot really create employment for ourselves so this is this these are, uh, are the uh, these are few of many other um many other things that i would indicate at this point and say this is how we are particularly affected as young people and again there is so many things that is happening in our communities that are depriving us of a better life as young people currently and possibly in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kulekani, uh, for sharing uh, really the experiences and your really uh, personal experience to it as well. So thanks very much. Now, um, I would like to go to you, maybe Jamie, uh, before um, uh, going to then uh, Jan Fry and then starting a new round. But with you, Jamie, maybe as a first question, so from your perspective as well, also really um, uh, being in touch with um, vulnerable communities, affected communities, so what uh, do you, from your perspective, what are the key elements that relate to adaptation from what you can see? Thank you, Alex, and thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, thank you for Kolokani uh, to talk about privilege. I'm speaking from a very privileged position. Look at me, white, male, elderly. I'm right at the top of the pile, I suppose. Uh, and I feel it's terribly patronizing, really, to talk about vulnerable people. But uh, in my defense, I suppose I work for an organization which is working in 40 or so countries, at least 20 of those countries we have. Um, adaptation uh, programming um, and we do hear the voices of the people affected by climate change so to an extent I, I sort of ask for the ask for the indulgence of those people in order to speak uh, on their behalf if not for them um, I don't really know where to start I haven't got any prepared notes but I, I, I would note from the IPCC report that uh, the bulk of adaptation, I think it's 30 somewhat percent of the adaptation actions that they uh, covered in the um, Working Group 2 report were adaptation conducted by individuals and households. And I think that's quite a good place to start really because um, if we're talking about, and we need to in adaptation, we're talking about scale. Why? First of all, those um, individuals and households, of course, aren't uh, necessarily in the most vulnerable communities in the sense of, uh, or they are in the most vulnerable communities in the sense of climate threats, 
because they've been uh, captured by the IPCC report on that basis. But vulnerability isn't just vulnerability to climate change. And I think that the message that I would bring possibly from the people that we work with is that uh, vulnerability is, is, um, uh, has its root causes in, in injustice, in inequality, and I would say primarily in poverty. Um, I think uh, to, to, to add to Alex's description of my job, I'm Senior Policy Advisor to Islamic Relief on poverty reduction, and that's drawn me directly into the work on climate adaptation because as a, as a setting for uh, the vulnerability um, and the difficulties of removing those vulnerabilities and increasing capacity and increasing resilience, uh, poverty stands out as being an overlying factor. Let's go back to those individuals and, uh, and families. Of course, uh, their actions are necessary and uh, and they should be celebrated in a sense rather than being demeaned by uh, by the idea well that's that's not effective of course it's not effective because collective action is always better than individual action but it is the action that's being held and it's to some extent sets the tenor um, of 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 uh, effective climate action um, I think that what's needed most for those impoverished uh, and uh, communities, people, um, and those facing injustice and inequality primarily is a form of empowerment, both social and economic empowerment, whereby they can turn back to their adaptation actions as individuals and, and, uh, and uh, households um, with a degree of um, agency within their circumstances. Um, it's not terribly efficient, probably, to, to um, invest in that sort of uh, individual action. Uh, there was a paper published uh, last year which suggested that there's a sort of sweet spot for climate action. Um, it it uh, and analysed what they called the powers of ten. Uh, and looked at the different scales of action and discovered this was a systematic review, so quite the gold standard of academic work. And they discovered that the most effective action in terms of uh, in terms of outcomes and efficiency was around 500 to 10,000 people. Communities of 500 to 10,000 people. So we need something in the adaptation realm to be able to translate those vulnerabilities, which are both to climate and to um, other intersectional uh, disadvantages, uh, into action that can be conducted at this very efficient uh, um, scale. And the... I'm sort of not answering your question, am I really, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that... Uh, uh, it's a question of scaling and the deal the the degree to which we can be successful in in this multilateral um, and, and you're quite right i mean we have a real problem in dealing at this very high level um intergovernmental uh, um sort of discussions about things which so much affect individuals and families and communities uh, and uh, and um, localities, uh, I think that the amount that support can be given from these high level, um, and especially in terms of finance and capacity building, no, I'll stop it there, especially in terms of finance, uh, but ensuring that that finance gets to those people who are, who are most vulnerable because of their climate circumstances, but also because of their preconditioned, pre, pre conditions. Is that what they called it in, in COVID? Um, the people who suffered most already were ill. The people who are suffering most from climate vulnerability are already poor. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jamie. Touching the mic very well. Thank you very much, Jamie. So um, I would like to turn to you. Uh, um, Jan Fry, just briefly, and I just take this opportunity briefly to mention that, Patricia, you have to leave in about 10 minutes, um, and then Frodo also soon after. So just after, I'll go back to you for maybe the final words, but just uh, so that we can hear briefly from first for first round uh, from you, um, uh, Jan, from 
the perspective. So now from this new position as the special rapporteur and really grounded in this, um, uh, the human rights perspective in relation to adaptation and also building on your experience of the uh, UNFCCC space and climate negotiations, where do you see really uh, that uh, link between human rights and adaptation? Uh, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, good to be part of this discussion. I, I, I want to sort of focus uh, your answer in, in, in the connection to the global goal on adaptation, because I, I think we have to think of what are the, uh, the, the criteria that we need to apply to a global goal uh, and, and uh, apply that. And as we've heard from previous speakers, this is not an easy thing to do because there are local challenges, individual challenges as far as adaptation is concerned. So putting that in a global context is not so easy. Uh, as we heard from the IPCC Working Group 2 reports, there are, you know, they clearly indicate that there are many natural systems that are at their hard limits of na uh, their natural adaptation capacity. So we, we, we've got to sort of look at those hard limits and put them into a context of how it relates to, to humans and, and, and define those. And I think a global goal should define those hard limits because we also need an entry point into how we deal with loss and damage. Because uh, you know, loss and damage is is uh, you know comes on board when we, we've reached our capacity to adapt, and and we need to do, have that sort of entry point. So there are a number of aspects of human rights that 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 play into this adaptation agenda, and and should be some sort of checklist. I think we should apply. So you know, the basic principles of right to life. Right, right to development, right to health, right to food, right to water and sanita sanitation, right to housing and cultural rights. These are all some of the basic principles and rights that are before us. And so we, we need to use those as a checklist for consideration of, of a global goal. But we also need to, within this sort of consideration, think about uh, you know, particular communities. So we need to be uh, gender responsive. We need to think about children. We need to think about persons with disabilities and, and how they're approached. Uh, and think about people in vulnerable situations. And of course, uh, uh, we also need to think about indigenous peoples. Uh, we have to think about local communities. And, and within this context of right to life, I, I think we have to overlay this concept of intergenerational equity. We have to think about not only uh, how adaptation meets immediate needs, but how it meets the needs of future generations and how we bring that on board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's it's um, great reflections that actually perfectly lead us into that second part of the discussion, starting with you, Patricia, to really, um, if you can share a little bit more from your perspective now, what more needs to be done? And uh, Jan was just discussing really maybe criteria for the GGA um, and how um, should the GGA really support what can, needs to be done um, from now and maybe your thoughts towards COP27. Um, so um, again, I'll base my comments on what the IPCC wrote in their working group to report uh, that a lot of the adaptation um, actions are very fragmented and done at the local level by household, as has also been mentioned. And so particularly, I think funding needs to increase, funding for adaptation, because the impacts, the gap between the impacts and the implementation of the actions is really has to be filled by financing. And then for most of these developing countries where the needs are even greater, I feel that funding should be channeled through um, local financing institutions. And uh, also a bottom-up approach, which has also been mentioned here in developing actions, because, um, for example, I like to mention that I visited a community, in an indigenous community somewhere in Kenya, 
and the local women in that community are seeing changes that they don't know what, what is causing the changes. So we helped them con contextualize them. So this is climate change that is happening. And so uh, what is what are you doing to adapt to it. They have actions, but these actions are not captured at the national level. There's no support from the national level to be able to implement the actions that they themselves feel will be best. So a bottom-up approach in the, in the uh, formation of the, or the characterization of the GGA would be very important. And even for countries, um, so the a UNEP adaptation gap report said that 13 out of 54 African countries have uh, NAPs. The rest um, uh, do not have these adaptation plans. And if we do not have plans, these are the basis for which strategies can be able to be developed. So again, uh, developing countries uh, need about 70 billion annually to be able to adapt. So really funding, and I'm sure you'll hear it a lot uh, from this panel, funding needs to increase. And um, despite that, it's also important to note that even with adaptation, losses and damages will still be seen, as is shown in the report. So maybe we can also think about uh, a fund or a facility to address loss and damage. That's what I would say. And with respect to uh, going towards COP27, I think building a common understanding on what the GGA is uh, would be very useful in helping countries see how to plug in from sub-national levels going up to the national level and even um, uh, how to track, adapt what metrics can we use to track adaptation at the global level and at the national level because contexts are different. So I think those are ideas that, or, the, or are things that countries can start thinking about as we head into COP, uh, into COP27. Thank you very much. And um, I know that you have to leave soon, so just feel free to leave uh, when you need. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, and so maybe continuing with you for the for the that second round also of question that leads us to really discuss what needs to happen no towards COP twenty seven. So from your perspective, um, what do you think we need to really um, what do we need to clarify to um, enhance that multilateral process specifically? the GGA in this case, to deliver this impactful adaptation that we were uh, discussing in light of the, um, the impacts that it has on uh, vulnerable communities. And um, then from your perspective as well, how does this GGA process can provide a unique space to elevate and to strengthen these global adaptation efforts from the process uh, itself? Well, thank you for, for the question, and, and indeed, uh, I wish I could give you a full, uh, comprehensive, uh, fixed answers to, 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 the, to the questions you, you raised. I mean, the, the uh, GLASS work program has just started. I, I, I cannot even say whether that glass is half empty or half full at this time, because we're just starting on it here now, and it will last uh, until 2020. Uh, for, for, for the next two, two, two years. Um, and, and I must say that although being part of this process of having agreed on the, on the, on the glass and, and the global goal on adaptation indeed as a negotiator, um, I struggle a little bit with the whole concept. <laughs> uh, why? Because a global goal on adaptation is challenging in the perspective of uh, acknowledging that that action and adaptation is, I think we just heard it from from uh, my colleague from uh, Patricia from Kenya, is context specific and very much uh, country country specific also. So how to bridge how to bridge that that gap between the action which is required at country level based on the knowledge, based on the capacities, based on what we have at the country level. And then this more theoretical, if you will, a concept of a global goal on adaptation. That's something I think we still need to define and work, on, work hard on. But of course, the global goal on adaptation is, is also a rallying point, And I think it stimulates thinking. Um, and I see it a lot relating to the sustainable development goals, but that's again because I come from sort of I have at least one one of my two feet in in the development 
uh, action uh, world and the other one in, in the negotiation track. And um, I, I think, I would like to think of, of the global goal of adaptation getting as much connected to the action track as possible. Uh, that, that may not be, be an, an easy uh, task, but we also heard Patricia talk about the national adaptation plans of which only 36 have been prepared so far. And there are challenges out there preparing those. Um, how can we make them useful? How can we make more, more countries develop these plans and not de only develop them plans, but also implement them, get the means to implement them? And also get uh, adaptation, I know it's an awful wor word in a way, but mainstreaming. Mainstreaming means to me getting it outside the silos that, that we often think of it in. I mean, to, to be quite honest with you, a lot of what happens here in Bonn and within negotiations is a little bit of bubble. Um, and, and, and I mean, we need to take it outside that bubble. We need to take it out to ministries of planning and finance and agriculture and what have you, and not least to the local communities. So Denmark, for example, we have, uh, we have endorsed these principle, international principles of locally led adaptation. We need to get funding out there. We need to build those capacities out there. We need to ensure that at that level where people uh, hopefully receive some support and funding, that they can make good use of it, that they are capacitated, and also there are government systems and institutions in place at that level. And that requires financing. Now, um, uh, just one more thing on this one. Of course, I mean, in, in Glasgow, we all know we agreed to double adaptation finance. So we need to work on this as we need to work on the 100 billion US dollar goal. And Denmark is part of what we call a champions group on adaptation finance. So we are pushing as hard as we can um, within, within uh, among ourselves, this group of around 10, 12 countries, to increase our adaptation, to ensure it's not only balanced. In fact, in Denmark, 60% of our climate fan finance is for adaptation. But we know out there in the world, the total figures are different. It's like 30%. Um, so we need to go much further in ensuring that finance flows for adaptation and it flows out where it's, it's, it's needed. So that's why we have this adaptation um, uh, cha champions finance uh, group. Um, and then you had a question also, what, to, what, to, what should we do uh, in the lead up to, to uh, COP27? Uh, uh, I would say, uh, go back home and work. I mean, because I mean, I'm, I'm not thinking of intercessional workshops and seminars. We, we, we know it's there. We're doing it all the time. And, and, and in Glasgow, we agreed on an awful lot of, of, of new intercessional processes and things, and we are dealing with them here in Bonn now. But I think it's more important we get back, try to help create that awareness uh, and engage uh, people outside this, com this climate uh, community and, 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 and uh, silo, if you, if you will, and explain um, what this is about and why action is needed and help to capacity those pe uh, people that can actually do that. I, I, I'm not sure it's, it's an extremely good answer to the question of what we need to do ahead of COP27 because I, I know it could be so many things, but I'm just trying to emphasize sort of the, the action on the ground part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts uh, also yeah, until COP27. I also know that you have to leave soon, uh, so don't hesitate to leave when you need to, but thank you very much for uh, joining and contributing. And maybe now that we have really started to um, go um, in depth into the, the discussion around really what needs to happen in terms of the process and the criteria around the GGA, maybe I can uh, move back to you, Adriana, uh, with the next question, which is then from your perspective in terms of the, the work that you were describing um, with indigenous peoples, then and the goal that should be enhancing uh, um, capacity and for resilience, adaptive capacities, what do you think uh, sh the GGA should consider uh, to really uh, strengthen adaptive capacities of indigenous peoples? Um, also, as a follow-up question, um, what would be locally uh, led adaptation principles um, could be of use in that really endeavor? 
Thank you. Uh, well, we all know that uh, climate change is a matter of global justice, right? And human rights. And the adaptation actions uh, are shaped by multiple um, of societal factors, such as cultural norms, uh, social practices, socio socioeconomic development, and it's underlined by physical and social vulnerabilities and societal mm -hmm. responses within all as relationships of power between countries and regions. And I think GGA needs to incorporate a principles based on, on the approach um, that works toward climate justice, inclusive and participatory Thank you. <laughs> Processes, <laughs> equity, and good governance. And it's important to consider the experiences of the people that is living that each day climate change and that is adapting because they they are the ones who have the experiences. They are the ones who are living it, and sometimes they are the ones who know to, how to lead with with this. And also. Um, all these efforts of the communities has to be like put together uh, with the governments, especially local governments. In Costa Rica, we have the experience of the municipalities who are uh, who made the exercise of identifying adaptation practices in their municipalities, and what they saw was that there's a autonomous adaptation. I don't know if that's the word in English. Autonomous, Autonomous adaptation, thank you. And it, it's important to, to identify those practices and, how, and see how can we reply them in other parts because maybe what I'm doing in Costa Rica can help what is happening in Nicaragua or in another part of the world. So I think it's important to identify those practices. And the other thing is that as South, uh, countries, we need resources. And I think uh, everyone has already said it, but if we don't have the resources to ident identify and to go and work with the communities, we are not able to do all these changes. And uh, the communities also need resources to implement the different ideas that they have, and also the organizations. So I think it's important to work along governments and uh, communities and work in the empowerment of the people. And I think uh, they already say it, like these people has a lot of knowledge and, and we need to work with them and not wait only for the political process that uh, it's in a bubble, <laughs> as uh, he was saying earlier. And I don't know if we go to the last question or not, the, until the COP27. Okay, I think it's important to have in mind always the communities and the most vulnerable regions. Usually we think that what happens here is what has to happen in the countries. And we need to be there and we need to understand their needs and we need to understand their culture and because we cannot just arrive with a plan and try to implement it. Uh, and we need to, to work on developing tools and, and learning and knowledge, sorry, with the people and facilitate community-based adaptation. I think there's a lot of the answers that we need and maybe it's cheaper. <laughs> and also we have witnessed that individual efforts of groups uh, in forgotten communities that make adaptation act uh, actions because they have not, not, not other option. They are already doing things and we cannot forget that. And also um, I believe that the challenge is that they don't have the, many of the resources that we can get in this kind of spaces. So I think it's important to, to understand that here is a political space, but more of the work has to be done in the ground, has to be done with the communities. And that's where we need to put a lot of our efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana. Um, yeah, this is very interesting, and I think I will now um, 
lead directly to back to you, Kulekani, to give us also from your perspective, what do you think um, should really happen in terms of climate policy decision making circles to really implement adaptation, as you were um, uh, describing uh, the effect. So maybe if you could like share your thoughts about that in the particular context of the GGA now. Um, and if you can actually already also uh, share your thoughts about what you think should happen towards COP27, um, then that would be really great to hear. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate what the other colleagues in the panel have said. I agree with everything they have said, and uh, I can already tell you that some of the things that they have mentioned were, were some of the thoughts that I was going to share. Uh, but maybe first of all, let me share uh, let me share the thought on what I think should happen at COP27. I think we should have clarities on these concepts. Uh, the other speaker said that, you know, there is even a difficulty in understanding the, the concept of the global adaptation goal. Uh, I, th I think those uh, when we are defining those concept concepts, when we are talking about them, when we are negotiating about them, there should be a an integration of the sense of agency in each of them. And by including a sense of urgency or even the word urgent, you know, when you're developing a goal, when you are defining a goal or trying to describe an objective of an initiative, the word urgent, that word is very much important to be included and it will enable even other policies to also um, to also <clears throat> be in in that in that framework of of, of agency. Um, when it comes to you know the elements that I think should be included in uh, just to transform our policies, I would mention um, just one thing which I think is very much important: the intergenerational equity that the, the other speaker talked about. And the intergenerational equity is obviously even in our preamble of the Paris Agreement. And then there are many other things that we can say, but this one I think is more important right now, which is creating opportunities for young people. And creating opportunities for young people, obviously that should go to capacity building. Uh, we know very well how that should, should work. Uh, that should go to education, it should go to, uh, to technology, like training and technology technology transfer. But the other one would be to create opportunities for young people to have spaces for dialogues, to have spaces to talk about what is happening. Um, Adri and my colleague here talked about, you know, we don't have data of, of what exactly is happening. We cannot even really articulate the situation that we are facing in our communities. And I can tell you right now, if I go back to my community, most of the time I would stay indoors, not because I want to, but because, you know, when I go outside and, and be with my, my other fellows, it would be difficult for me to, you know, to be with them in a kind of like informal setting, simply because I have an opportunity that they did, that they don't have, you know, even an opportunity to be, um, to be in a workshop or maybe to be to have an opportunity to just an opportunity to be in a platform where we can talk about our issues, where we can when where we can where we can, you know, <clears throat> and try to uh, do the networking. And I think that will help in terms of also bringing back the hope from young people who are being, you know, uh, day to day being demotivated about uh, about the situation that is happening. <clears throat> and lastly, I think I would want to tell you that the Lutheran World Federation could be an example of maybe some kind of a method in, uh, through which we can do that creation of opportunities for young people. The, the Lutheran World Federation in its climate justice work, it has only young people that are championing it, whether you talk about going to, to COPS, whether you talk about you know engaging and doing policy interventions, 
And the, it, all, all that process is championed by young people. And I can tell you today that I'm here because the, the LWAF, Luther and White Federation, created that opportunity for me. Back in 2016, uh, when I attended the COP for the first time in COP22, I knew almost nothing about the negotiations. I was only conscious about what is happening. I could not at the time, you know, articulate what, it, what was happening. And, um, you know, when I got to the climate negotiations, I wanted more. When I went back to my community, I wanted more. And when I was invited to other to other platforms, I wanted to I wanted to know more. I wanted to engage more. And that is why I am here today. You know, so so the the, the LWF uses a quota system, and maybe to make sure that you know the the concept of intergenerational equity is properly integrated in this global climate global adaptation goal or in other adaptation policies, we may use a terminology which is an equity system. You know, an equity system whereby if you are targeting a vulnerable community, you identify the population. You say there is so much women, there is so much young people, and there's so much persons living with disability. And then in order for us to reach um, uh, uh, all of them equitably, let us identify the percentages. You know, uh, maybe we'll say we want to, we want to reach, reach, we want to reach uh, 40% of young people and uh, 30% of, of women, or maybe 40% of women and 30% of young people, and, and, and also, you know, something like that. And uh, an equitable system, I think that would be a good methodology that, you know, that can integrate this issue of intergenerational equity in our policies and in our climate goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, colleague Annie, for these inputs. Um, Yes, thank you very much. I am um, noting of the time, so I would like to um, I would like to pose maybe like uh, then before taking some questions from the room, I would like to maybe ask one question to both uh, you, Jamie, and you, Ian, in terms of the process. So from your perspective, um, Jamie, and from your perspective based on uh, grounded in human rights, Ian, just if you could briefly reflect on the interaction between uh, the global goal on adaptation process and the global stock take, for instance, and where you see uh, from your respective um, perspective that the uh, links could be strengthened to really support um, concrete delivery on the global goal on adaptation. Do you want to go first on this one? It's an easy question. No, I'll just give all the answers and then you won't have anything to say, will you? Uh, I, briefly is impossible. Um, so I, I can sort of half answer the question and say that they certainly should be combined. Um, the Global Goal for Adaptation um, was invented because it wanted to bring exactly the awareness of adaptation into the into the political process in the in the way that mitigation had. So it it was uh, a push from the uh, African countries and other and least developed countries in order to to um, build up adaptation as against mitigation. I mean, not against mitigation, but alongside mitigation. Um, and the global goal is quite easily expressed. It is it is uh, building capacity, uh, increasing resilience, and, and and lessening vulnerabilities. That's that's the goal. The translation of that into global uh, is problematic. I would just uh, m briefly mention uh, input from the small island states in the both the global goal and the um, the uh, global stock take um, workshops that have happened this week uh, with a slogan w uh, which actually reflects very much what Adriana was saying at the very end of, w of what you said there. It's a global responsibility adaptation, but it's local action that's going to lead to adaptation. And I think that that's the political, is the global responsibility. Um, and and the the uh, the local is is where the work has to be done and has to be most effective. Um, having said that, uh, the question is about um, is about collaboration between these two elements of the same um, organisation, and of course they should be working in concert. It has been a problem throughout the UNFCCC. Um, uh, the history of the UNFCCC, that adaptation has been very split and very, it's a bit like adaptation on the ground. It's, it's very fragmented and, and, and the more coordination that's possible and collaboration that's possible, but not just between GGA and, and, the, uh, and the global stock take, 
um, but also with uh, other mechanisms of the United Nations like the Sandow Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Agenda 30, the, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, these are all intermeshed and integrated, but of course you need to break things up to make them easily understandable, and I would still urge that we do that with a very strong look at what's happening locally. We've had mention of the principles for locally led adaptation and I do commend those to everybody here, everybody who's listening. Um, you'll find the, the it's a one page of A4, it's only eight very simple points, but it sets out um, the way that adaptation can work at every scale, so how every, every right the way from this multilateral through to regional, through to national, through to provincial, or through to um, to uh, local government and through to, right the way through, down to families and individuals, how um, adaptation can be supported. Um, it was developed by the uh, Global Commission on Adaptation, which has sort of become a historical thing now, but this, is, this was the great work of, of, of the action around adaptation in the last 10 years. Um, and the eighth one is about collaboration. It's about... Uh, it's about um, uh, collaborate, collaborative action and collaborative investment uh, and so it's it's bringing together surely it's the locally led principles but at every level thank you thank you very much and Ian if you want also to add some thoughts in terms of like towards COP28 then uh, you can add that to your answer too uh, COP27 sorry uh, thank you and uh all has been said, so I don't have to say anything. No, no I, I mean, the, the, the crucial issue is that we are facing a climate emergency. Uh, and, and therefore, we, we have to have a response to that uh, urgency, uh, that emergency. And, and therefore, the work that needs to be done on the global goal of adaptation has to be done quickly. Uh, we, we have to have, even though the glass sets a sort of three-year work program, we've got, or two-year work program, we, we've got to work quicker than that. Uh, you know, being in this negotiation process for a long time, I know that, you know, there are parties who want to slow the process, uh, but we have to work ahead of that. Uh, and, and to feed into the global stock take, we've got to set some benchmarks of what can be done on adaptation well ahead of the discussion on the global stock take. So it clearly feeds into that process. So I, I strongly encourage people to come up with these sorts of benchmarks that we can develop so that it will feed into the global stock take so that we can get a clear assessment well before this glass program finishes. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, as we are going, we, we now have a few minutes for questions, yes, from the, from the room. Is there any questions that you would like to ask um, from the event? And online, I don't know if I can see if there is any question online, but... Um, Yes, there is one question in the back. So we're bringing the mic so that people online can listen. Um, what do you think... Is it on? Uh, what do you think is the best way to make sure loss and damage is being thematized during the COP27? Who would like to take that on? Um, Jamie, do you want to? Uh, not the best way, but a way is the drumbeat. Where I think we've heard it quite resoundingly at this uh, uh, in Bonn. Um, the, the drumbeat for loss and damage finance facility, it has to be there by COP27. And the best way is to carry on talking about it, to carry on putting it in front 
of all discussions about each area, including mitigation, but definitely adaptation. And I think in the uh, workshops, we've heard an increasing uh, um, demand for loss and damage finance and the proper consideration of loss and damage. It's just keep on talking about it, organise, get into these um, uh, these petitions, get into the... And I was amazed at this week how effective actually standing outside rooms and chanting about loss and damage was because it really did make a difference it, it, it changed the whole sense of what was happening in the Glasgow dialogue meetings on on loss and damage finance so um, be be informed about loss and damage uh, and and talk about it act on it and um, join together with organizations that are pushing for it to, to for a facility to be uh, settled by by Sheikh. Uh, thank you Jamie is there any, do you want to uh, uh, bring something to the question? Just a quick thing. I, I think part of the reason it didn't get through in Glasgow was there wasn't a clear picture of particularly the finance facility is where is the money going to come from and how will it, how will it operate? And so there needs to be that clarity. Of course, there were other countries who are, are directly opposed to anything on loss and damage, and we have to get around that. And to do that, uh, you know, pressure needs to be put on the COP presidency to say, yes, we want a finance facility at the COP, and for everybody to be making that noise to the COP presidency. So they, they can't see the COP uh, being successful without that facility being established. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, there is another question. Um, thank you very much for the interesting discussion. I am totally for the previous speaker's point on the operational modalities and frameworks for the financing facility. Because if you think about it, uh, without a defined scope, if I'm country X and I lose my coal plant in a hurricane, would I be eligible for loss and damage finance? So those kinds of things need to be defined before we lay it all out and before we totally support um, the loss and damage finance facility. Thank you very much for this comment. And it really shows the, the um, just the very deep link between uh, now uh, in the er era where we are between adaptation and loss and damage. Um, there is, there is, um, and it's sort of almost obstructive. This, this. Well, we want the details. We want to know what it is. It, it can uh, Climate Action Network has set out in a, in a, in, a, in a paper which you can see uh, see on the website uh, clearly what the demands are for a, uh, for a finance facility. So this sort of, it's really a sort of distraction in a way saying, oh, we don't know what it is, we've got to be clear about it. Well, there is clarity and, and um, that needs to, that really needs to be taken now and, and efforts be made to establish the facility. Somebody speaking wants to answer that. Thank you. There is another question and uh, Adriano, so whenever you want to come in, just come in. So yes, please. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the great present panel discussion. Um, I was hoping you could unpack a little bit more adaptation finance and also um, the sort of rights framing of finance for, um, for climate action as well. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe for the um, unpacking the rights framing for adaptation, do you want to um, answer, Jan? Thank you. Well, I, I sort of gave those that sort of list of, of the, the basic sort of human rights concepts that we need to incorporate within adaptation planning. And I, I, I you know, the right to life, health, food, these are all the basics of rights that we should be incorporating. And, and, and within that, you know, we have to recognise uh, obligations with regard to Indigenous peoples and gender. So we have to bring those together. I, I had a meeting this morning with the UN Convention on, on Desertification, and I, that was very useful. They're doing a lot of work on tenure 
on land tenure because that's a, a critical issue uh, around being able to ensure that land is protected in, a, in a adaptation. But it also flows into Indigenous people's rights. There has to be recognition of, of uh, uh, you know, rights to land by Indigenous peoples uh, within this sort of framing as well. Thank you. I, I, I just want to add, and not from a very technical perspective, but I think when, when we go to a community to develop any kind of activity, sometimes we forget that they already have their culture and their way of living, and, and we think that we, got, we have a solution and they have to take it. And I don't know, for example, sometimes... Uh, from my experience, uh, sometimes they go and build houses because the community lose all their houses. And when you go and do a follow-up in the community, you see that the house is not being used and people still living outside. And when we ask them why they are not using their house, it's because it, it doesn't respond to their needs or to their culture. So I think in the right side, we, we need to understand that it's it's important to consider culture and how they see the world before implementing a, just a, like a recipe, as if it worked in everywhere. Just that. Thank you very much. Um, Kulikanya, I don't know if you're still online and if you would like to come in as well. I think that just as I was asking you, probably you got disconnected, I have the feeling. Um, maybe, so thank you very much. Maybe there is one last question. Thank you, thank you. We, I have followed closely the discussion of uh, loss and damage. Some of it has been general, some of it very constructive. But I wanted to find out uh, how do you really quantify the cost of the loss and damage that we talk about? I know that uh, some of these disasters are natural. Yeah, some of them are induced and some of them are because of our carelessness. So how, how do you quantify the loss, the financing of loss and damage? May I be guided? Jamie, do you want to? It's a very difficult question for me to answer without a microphone. Um, a very difficult question for me to answer because I'm not a specialist in loss and damage, but I would take the example of Mozambique and the, and the uh, uh, cyclone uh, that struck there and the uh, debt to Mozambique or the cost to Mozambique were cal calculated uh, very clearly uh, in, by the IMF and the World Bank in order to give them loans, uh, quite punitive loans as it happens, uh, which is an indication of where loss and damage funding should happen. They, they shouldn't have to increase their debt. But the numbers were quite clear. There's also the... Um, the, uh, the um, non-economic loss and damage to be taken into account. But before, I'm, I'm going to defer to a colleague who's in the audience who might be able to answer better for me, but just to unpack a little bit about uh, adaptation finance, I think there's, there's several things involved with adaptation finance. One is the gross numbers, the amount of finance that's available for the international community. There's also the question of access, who can get to that money and how, how accessible it is, uh, uh, as we've been talking to those people that are best uh, placed to be able to utilise those funds. Um, and I think the I idea of... Um, the Green Climate Fund, for instance, it's it's such a difficult, difficult process. And even the scale that they talk about, I think the they talk about small projects of ten million uh, pounds, which uh, ten million dollars. Uh, well, that's not a small project uh, in 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 most of the real world. Um, so the idea of being able to operate at that level, especially with the difficulties and constraints, makes accessibility a big issue. But um, but could I ask my colleague at the back there, Dave, to, to could you give him the microphone just to answer the question about loss and damage, if there's yes. time? Yes, in one minute. One minute you've got, Dave. One minute, I'm counting. 
Thank you, Jamie. Um, to, the, to the questions of loss and damage, um, I would just say that, uh, and, and to what Ian said, uh, as a, because of the, um, uh, the fact that the facility was raised by the G77 and China, it was put on the agenda, it should have been in the outcome document, it didn't end up, it was downgraded into a Glasgow dialogue, but Can International with Stamp Out Poverty, Christianaid and other organizations have created a report uh, on this. It's going to be discussed actually at the next, at the next um, um, side event uh, in this room in about 15 minutes time. But for those that have asked questions, you ask questions, the gentleman there asked questions. This is a takeaway, this is the executive summary of that report. In it, it talks about the volume of loss and damage. It quotes people like Salim al Huk to say that human-induced climate change is what we have now. He would say there's no such thing as a natural disaster anymore. Now we have 1.1 degrees of extra warming because of our activities. Uh, so I highly recommend you to come to the next side event. And if you want any um, stuff in writing, I can furnish that to you now. Thank you very much. Um, that's um, yes. Thank you very much. We are. I think we are um, wrapping up now. I would like to um, give the just before we'll finish. I would like to give the the mic to uh, one of the co-organizers, Valerian Berna from Brahma Kumaris, who will be uh, sharing maybe just a wrap up thoughts on the everything that was shared. Um, and uh, from my end, we can really see also this deep connection between the uh, global goal on adaptation, the global stock take, and really how we need to really move forward um, uh, in in a way uh, with really this uh, cross pollination or like really um, making one process and able to move the other one faster. Um, so now I hand over to Valerian and a, a big thank you to all uh, our speakers today. Thank you on my behalf as well. And uh, I personally really um, enjoyed the, the variety of people working with um, the communities. I've heard how much there is already resilience, as Adriana was saying, as Kulekani was saying, how people are already reacting, are already acting, are already uh, responding to all the different needs that are showing them their faces in front of them and how therefore the local communities have to be consulted. They have to be at the heart of the solutions because only they know how to adapt according to their situation. So thank you for bringing all this. Um, I also felt it was very important to hear how there are cross-cutting issues that we have to realize and take care of as such because we can find them in mitigation, we can find them in adaptation. They're so present into the loss and damage. And I think ambition is a word that was used that I think is a very important word to bring into the conversation to actually find the right solutions. There are many things I could really um, uh, talk about. I also think that we have to understand how nature is connected with human beings and how human beings are connected uh, to each other from the political bubble, as we said, to the local level. We don't know who is going to be affected next, but capacity building empowerment are really uh, essential to make us a resilient people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that concludes the event today. Thank you very much. Thank you.